the Feast of Tabernacles and how it applies to the end times. If you look at Leviticus 23:36, it says, For seven days present offerings made to the Lord by fire, and on the eighth day hold a sacred assembly and present an offering made to the Lord by fire. It is the closing assembly. Do no regular work. Then in verse 42, it says, live in booths for seven days. All native-born Israelites are to live in booths. Those booths are tents or sukkahs, sukkahs. Uh, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths, sukkahs, when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So this is the defining characteristic of the Feast of Tabernacles is that they lived in booths, and they lived outside of their houses. And all the Israelites lived outside their homes. They built little booths, sukkahs, and lived in them for seven days. And they had two feasts, the eighth day and the first day. So what does that have to do with the end times? First of all, if we look at Exodus 23, 16, it says, Celebrate the Feast of Harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. Celebrate the Feast of Ingathering at the end of the year when you gather your crops from the field. This is talking about the Feast of Tabernacles, which is also the Feast of Ingathering. So it's a feast of the first fruits. So that's interesting, isn't it? The first fruits. And at that time, all the crops of your field are harvested. The harvesting is done. So you're basically saying it's the end of the harvest. If you look at Deuteronomy 16, 13 to 17, it says, Celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days after you have gathered the produce of your threshing floor and your wine press. Be joyful at your feast, you, your sons, daughters, your men servants and maidservants, and the Levites, the aliens, the fatherless, and the widows who live in your towns. For seven days celebrate the feast to the Lord your God at the place the Lord will choose. For the Lord your God will bless you in all your harvest and in all the work of your hands, and your joy will be complete. Isn't that something? Three times a year all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. No man should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. Now this is interesting because of the way a covenant works. A covenant with God means that he does something and we do the same thing. We do the same thing as he does. Like when um, Abraham was about to sacrifice his son Isaac on the altar, and God said, don't do it. But he waited till the very last minute because it was a parallel of what God was going to do for us when he sent Jesus, and he actually went through with it. And this is a parallel here going in the other direction. If you look at Deuteronomy 16, it says, three times a year your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. So that means that there's three times a year that the Lord is going to appear before us. Okay, because that's the way a covenant works. At the Feast of Unleavened Bread, okay, we know that happened. Jesus appeared to us at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and he, he actually died on the cross. He, um, you know, he, was, he actually rose from the dead during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So he appeared to us, risen from the dead, on, on the, uh, during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The second one is the Feast of Weeks, Pentecost. Well, that's when the Holy Spirit was presented to us. God presented himself to us as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was presented to us. Um, he appeared to us. The Holy Spirit appeared to us in tongues of fire that came down and came to rest on the apostles. So, and on the 120, I should say, in the upper room. So, um, and then the last one is the Feast of Tabernacles. So we know the Lord is going to appear to us on the Feast of Tabernacles. This is going to happen. Now, whether it's, there's a you know, question of whether this would be the rapture or the day of the Lord. Um, I have an opinion on the subject, but you can decide for yourself what you think. But um, the parallels are uncanny to the rapture when you look at the Feast of Tabernacles. They live in tents uh, away from their homes. They live in tents for seven days. And, and then in the eighth day, they had the feast. It's just like 2 Corinthians 5. If you look at 2 Corinthians 5, it says, and starting in verse 1, Now we know that if the earthly tabernacle, that's booth, sukkah, 
we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling. Because when we are clothed, we'll not be found naked. For while we are in this tabernacle, which would be our bodies, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed with the heavenly dwelling. That's the course the new bodies we receive at the rapture, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. In 1 Corinthians 15, um, it tells us, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what body do they come? Foolish one, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies. And what you sow, you do not sow the body that is going to be, but a bare grain. It may be of wheat or some of the rest, and God gives it a body according to as he has willed, and to each of the seeds its own body. Not every flesh is the same flesh, but one flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fish, another of birds, and there are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. Here we go. There are heavenly bodies and earthly bodies, but the glory of the heavenly is truly different, and that of the earthly different. One glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, and stars differ from star and glory. So also is the resurrection from the dead. You remember what happens at the rapture. It says, first the dead are raised, then we rise up to meet the Lord in the air. So the dead are raised first. Um, after the dead raise and we meet the Lord in the air, it says that at that point is when we are, that's when obviously we're changed because we go up to meet the Lord in the air and we can't fly. So obviously we have our new bodies at that point. If we continue reading, starting at verse 44, it says, It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. So also it has been written, The first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But not the spiritual first, but the natural. Afterward, the spiritual. The first man was out of the earth, earthy. The second was the Lord out of heaven. Such the earthy man, such also the earthy ones. And such the heavenly man, such also the heavenly ones. And as we bore the image of the earthy man, so shall we also bear the image of the heavenly man. And this I say to you, brothers, that flesh and blood is not able to inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all fall asleep, that means die, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a glance of an eye, at the last trumpet, for a trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So here we see what happens at the rapture. At the rapture, we put on our new tabernacle. We're, we long to be clothed with that tabernacle, like it says in 2 Corinthians 5.1. We would long to be clothed with that tabernacle, and, and that is a heavenly one. And we are currently in the earthly tabernacle. This earthly tabernacle, when it is gone, we're going to have our heavenly tabernacle. So the, the Feast of Tabernacles is a parallel of that. And on the last day, the last day is the greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles. On the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus stood up, John 7, uh, verse 2, it says, but when the feast, the Jewish feast of tabernacles was near, then it goes on to verse 37. It says, in that la in the last day, in that great day of the feast, the great day of the feast is the last day, the eighth day of the feast of tabernacles is the great day. Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Now, that sounds like he's making a last appeal. It sounds like he, Jesus is saying, come to me. You, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his innermost beings will flow rivers of living water. He says, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So he's making a last appeal. He's make, making like a last appeal, like this is the last chance before I come and get the church. Come and get, you know, actually bring those new tabernacles, the new tabernacles are, are built, and it's time to get out of this old one that you've been living in for the last seven days, parallel, is, you know, living in for the last seven days, and now you're going to, you know, get your new ones. The seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles are meant to represent the 40 years that the Israelites wandered in the desert, and that is a 
very symbolic also of us living in our earthly bodies and how just like the Israelites when they came into the promised land after that we come into our promised land which is the new Jerusalem the new Jerusalem is the bride of Christ and that's where we live we end up living and we're clothed with that that new dwelling Jesus um, is the light of that city, uh, the New Jerusalem, and we go in and out of it. We live in that New Jerusalem. So, uh, so the New Jerusalem we know from from the Word is that is the Bride of Christ. And what happens at the wedding supper of the Lamb? We go up, and that's when the rapture happens. We go up to meet the Lord in the air, and we go to the wedding supper of the Lamb, just like the five virgins who were ready and the five that weren't. You know, the five that were ready, they went up and they attended the wedding supper of the Lamb. And the wedding supper of the Lamb is for the new Jerusalem, our new dwelling. It's about our new dwelling. Our new dwelling, what is it? We received our new bodies, our new glorified bodies, as described in 1 Corinthians 15. And then the New Jerusalem is where we is an actual city where you know we actually end up living. That's where you know where we live in our glorified bodies. So this is all uh, you know very parallel to you know the rapture in the end times. Now whether the rapture happens on the last day of Sukkot of the Feast of Tabernacles, that's uh, something none of us know for sure. But there, just as there are many reasons to believe that it would happen on the Day of Atonement. And on Rosh Hashanah, there's also many reasons to believe that it could very well happen on the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, but anyways, it, we don't know for sure one way or the other, but it is really interesting to, to see things through that light.